if you have a text, please keep it open to Psalm 8. Or if you are looking at it digitally, keep it at Psalm 8. And we'll also be moving into the New Testament, into Hebrews chapter 2. So be prepared to move a bit today. All right. I have a confession to make. I hate flying. Not because of the airplanes or because of what's going to happen were I to crash. I'm, I'm, I imagine I would, a few puffs of oxygen and all would be well. <laughs> no, it's what it does to me. When I get at that height, 30 plus thousand feet, or as we're taking off or landing, I'm overwhelmed by how small I am. I think, I think it's the distance, the way everything appears in miniature. The roads become like trails of ants, like in my kitchen, it's scurrying in long, winding lines. And I, I look at a car and I think, who's in that car? Or where are they going? And then, after a few questions like this, the sheer weight of the number of people and stories and their pain hits me and makes me wonder who's ever seen me from that high up and thought these questions. Do these people we see feel insignificant? And this thought, this is why I hate flying, it, it can reduce me to panic or desperation. An existential crisis at 30,000 feet. <laughs> this is not the place to freak out. But those questions about all of these other people I see drive me then to questions about me. Who am I? Am I just one of the other seven billion souls bumping around? Today, I'd like us to hear what God has been saying to his people about who we are in relation to him and in relation to creation. And our starting off point, or maybe better, our entryway into this question is the beloved eighth Psalm. Then we'll look at the way it's used in Hebrews. We'll return to the Old Testament and wrap it all up in 12 minutes. All right. We've read, we've read Psalm 8. And right off the bat, some general remarks regarding the psalm. One, this is a psalm of praise that would have caused any listener or performer, singer of this psalm to immediately think of Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. But looking back at Psalm 8, it's curious that this is what David chooses to use to praise God's power. You almost expect the praise to come after verse 3. When I look at your heavens, they're amazing, we expect the, David to continue. However, Immediately upon looking, David uses his insignificance as an expression of God's power. Perhaps David's even, like me in the plane, confronted with his own smallness. Look at David's life. I mean, the trajectory of it, it was filled with very high highs and incredibly low lows. I imagine David at times was tempted to despair. And as he looks up at the night sky, he may have felt torn between what he confesses, the theology of Genesis 1, and what he sees. His theology places man above this created order, but look at the created order. It, there's so much of it, and we are so small. But in David, this doesn't lead, like it has to me on aisle 26b, to fear or skepticism on David's part. He breaks forth in praise. Look at what he says. First, man has been made a little less than the Elohim. Verse 5. This is a clear nod back to the image of God in Genesis 1. Elohim, these gods are the divine beings that make up the, um, the, the Lord's court. The Septuagint calls them angels. Now then David continues bragging on God's favor towards us in verses 5 and 6. And at this point, it's quick to notice. Some would say the Old Testament lacks grace. Well, here are some. Look at 5 and 6. You have made man, crowned him, and given him. Man's position was given by God. It was never earned, never merited. So Psalm 8 is a hymn of praise to the God who has placed us over his creation. 
The psalm then moves in verses 6 to 8 to our responsibility, the care and governance of the created order. Think Genesis 1.28 now. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth, the cultural mandate. Read in this way, Psalm 8 pushes us away from self-preoccupation and anxiety through praise and wonder, finally, outwards, to explore and tend God's good creation. But we can't stop at Psalm 8. We must press through to the New Testament's use of Psalm 8, and that is in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 6. So if you could flip there in your texts. Hebrews chapter 2 Starting in verse 5, we read, Now it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere. I imagine the author knew it was Psalm 8, but it's <laughs> left here. Perhaps the, the canon was in flux. I don't know. What is man that, that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. All right, so that was the Psalm 8 bit. Now we get some exposition. Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who, for a little while, was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. Okay? We read the Old Testament in light of the New Testament as the Christian confessing church. But that's perhaps overly simplistic. Bear with me. Psalm 8 is going to make a lot of cameos in the New Testament, and we've seen the clearest exposition of its use. It's also used in Matthew. Paul uses it in 1 Corinthians. He quotes it, and then in Ephesians 1.22, it's probably lurking behind Paul's statement that in Christ will have everything put under his feet. Okay? But to the astute reader of Psalm 8 and Hebrews 2.6, something's different about the way Hebrews uses Psalm 8. First, God's has become angels. That's okay, no problem. The second difference, however, has allowed the New Testament, the writer of Hebrews, to take this psalm in a new direction. Psalm 8 in the Psalter tells us that God made man a little lower than the angels, a matter of degree. In the Septuagint, the Greek translation, which the writer of Hebrews is using of Psalm 8, we have a Greek word that's temporal, for a little while or for a little time. This allows the author of Hebrews to link Psalm 8 with the incarnation of Jesus Christ. In Psalm 8, we felt a tension between man as ruler of creation, yet his insignificant, his insignificance. They were, they were in, sort of at odds with each other. In Hebrews, we see from verse 8 the plain fact that man does not have control of this world. In his fallen state, man has not fulfilled the promise of the covenant. Then, like today, the effects of sin and greed can be seen amongst humanity and on the creation itself. There is a disconnect. So then, how can we say Psalm 8 is accurately describing man? The author of Hebrews' answer is simple. It's Jesus Christ. Look at verse 9. We see Him who for a little while was made lower than the angels. The coming age of verse 5 is already subjected to Christ, the author tells us, the pioneer of our salvation. In this way, the New Testament uses David's promise and praise and fills them up and in this way, David's promise is wholly realized in the true representative human. That's Jesus Christ. So what? <laughs> well, at Knox, we are reading and teaching and training pastors and students to read the Bible theologically. We would be remiss if I, for example, taught Psalm 8 and left the Old Testament students simply thinking this is what David meant. That would be purely descriptive. We want to read and teach and think theologically, description is not adequate. As we struggle as Christians to hear what God said and says to His people through the Old Testament, we're forced to reframe our question of who am I, and we cannot answer it apart from Jesus Christ. We can't know who we are or how we relate to God 
or creation without factoring in Jesus. The New Testament clearly tells us that everything is not in subjection to humans, rather to Christ. But, and I guess I'd be expected to ask this question, then what do we do with the rest of the Old Testament? And the way it describes humankind. If Hebrews has the ultimate answer, how do we figure in what the Old Testament says about who we are in relation to God and the, and the creation? This is possible, and we can do it, as long as we are committed to listening to each testament clearly and then together. We read the Old Testament in light of the New Testament, and we read the New Testament in light of the Old. We've gone from the Old to the New. Let's go now from the New to the Old. With Hebrews and Psalm 8 framing this picture, let's look at the question of who are we in the Old Testament again. In other Old Testament texts, man as ruler of creation seems to crash up or conflict with his seeming insignificance and even his anguish. When man in other places in the Old Testament looks at his life and the world he inhabits, it brings despair. Think about Job. His very existence threatens him. In 7, 16, 19, he says, I loathe my life. I would not live forever. Leave me alone. He's speaking to God. For my days are a breath. What is man that you make so much of him? and that you set your heart on Him. Visit Him every morning and test Him every moment. How long will you not look away from me, nor leave me alone to swallow my spittle? Did you hear the phrase? What is man that you make so much of him? Job spits it bitterly instead of David whispering it in awe in Psalm 8. In Job, God's presence is not, his presence is not received as grace, but a part of his affliction. God's presence reminds Job of his own insignificance. Like Israel, Job's election to a special place in creation as a living man is now a burden. To Job, man, to be man, is to be dead, to have no value. Here he says, just leave me alone. Ecclesiastes runs in the same vein. 3.11, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. The preacher in Ecclesiastes continues, For what happens to the children of man and what happens to the beasts is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. Man has no advantage over the beasts. For all is vanity. All go to one place. Whew, what do we do with this? All right. So we've seen some representative pictures of the Old Testament, seemingly contrary pictures pictures of who, who man is in relation to who God is and what creation is in our place as the signal, signal uh, created beings. Let's return to Psalm 8 in light of them. What Hebrews does with Psalm 8 then now is going to start to make sense. Hebrews tells us that only when we understand man in the light of the man, Jesus Christ, can we understand what God has intended the entire time for humanity. The man Jesus was not removed from the pain that Job felt. He entered into it fully, and through suffering and temptations to despair, like the preacher in Ecclesiastes, he brought life to all men. Reading the Old Testament in light of the New Testament, here we can say that in Jesus Christ, true humanity has already appeared. Conversely, reading the New Testament in light of the Old Testament around this question can also be helpful. First, it tells us that the world to come of Hebrews 2.5 can never be divorced or removed from the created order in Psalm 8. We are called, as Peter tells us, to move and live God-reflecting lives amidst a lost world. And second, the first verse and the last verse of Psalm 8, how majestic is God's name in all the earth, they anchor the church against functional Gnosticism. We're not called by Christ to a pious escape. Christ's redemption is for all men. In both the Old and New Testament, God's salvation has cosmic implications. John, in Revelation 14, 11, quotes Isaiah on this theme, saying, For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow, and every tongue will give praise to God. God's name will be majestic in all the world. So, back to this question of who are we and do we matter? And maybe the more personal matter, my airplane anxiety, right? I like to read a passage from the, ba the Babylonian Talmud, a normal practice I know in Knox chapels, and then, and then share an anecdote and then reframe it and we'll be done. 
This is from the Babylonian Talmud, a collection of um, rabbinic tradition, traditional interpretations of scripture. This is collected between the 3rd and 5th centuries, so uh, A.D. And it reads as this. A man mints many coins with one stamp, all of them the same as another. But the king of kings, the holy one, blessed he, he minted every person with the stamp of Adam, and not one of them is the same as his fellow. For this reason, every single person must say, the world was created for me. Now, according to rabbinic tradition, 19th century rabbi named Bunim of Peshikha taught that, quote, every man must have two pockets with a note in each pocket so that he can reach into one or the other depending on the need. When feeling lowly and depressed, discouraged or disconsolate, one should reach into the right pocket and there find the words, for my sake the world was created. But when feeling high and mighty, he should reach into the left pocket and find the words, I am but dust and ashes. It's a nice reminder, but it lacks the component that introduced by Christ. The fact is, in faith, we believe and confess we were first minted in the print of Adam, but we have been minted again with the stamp of Christ. And as our psalm instructs, we move into creation now as his servants. Instead of reading the rabbi's little piece of paper and reading the words, for my sake the world created, we should now pull it out in the airplane or wherever and be reminded that in Christ we have been created for the world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the enduring power of your word. I pray, Father, that those here would fetch truth from my fumbling lips and that you would be given all the glory and praise. Strong name of Christ. Amen. Amen.